My guest is a superstar runner born with no legs. He's an eight-time Paralympian who's broken all records, even the Oscar Pistorius records. His speed and athleticism is nothing short of spectacular. And now, like Oscar, he wants to compete in the Olympics, but has been cut short because of the court of arbitration for sports. They think his prosthetic legs are too long making him six foot two. And they backed their decision based on a study of runners from Europe and Asia. Blake is an African-American and obviously disputes this fact because clearly their research is wrong. And Blake, he's living proof that the sporting world is fighting every day to inspire people to be free of racial discrimination. And in my opinion, world athletics should be leading that fight. So let's talk to him, a man who will be the fastest man on the planet, Blake Leeper. Welcome to On The Mic. Thank you so much. What an amazing introduction, just kind of explaining like what I'm battling right now and what I'm going through and how crazy it sounds, but it's, it's a reality. And that's and that's what I'm dealing with right now, this fight trying to get into the Olympic Games next year. I just want to congratulate you on your stellar career. It, it, it's been such a brilliant run, if you pardon the pun, and, and the, the sky's the limit. You want to be the fastest man on the planet man on the planet yeah it, it, it's kind of crazy to think you know like you, if you go back you know go back 31 years you know the day that i was born with a congenital birth defect fibula hemimilia that conversation with the doctors and my, my and my parents was basically like look blake's born missing both of his legs he's never going to walk he's never going to run he's never going to play sports he, he's going to be in a wheelchair his whole life and you guys might want to find you know things that's not only easier for him but for you as well be having a disabled child being born without legs Fast forward, you know, the life that I live with, you know, great parents and, and a great environment and, and they instilled a great attitude of, of positivity. And, and now here I am, one of the fastest men in the world, legs or no legs. I'm, uh, last year in 2019, I was the, the sixth fastest man in the world in 400 meters. And the year before that, I was the eighth fastest man um, in, in the 400 meters. So I just like, I wish I could go back to that hospital room, you know, and be like, look at those doctors like, you was wrong. You were so wrong. <laughs> hey man, there, there was nothing to be worried about if you uh, look at it in hindsight. But I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about your family. Uh, I, want, I want to talk to you about all the trials and tribulations growing up when you first got your legs. But first, let's, let's get to what's in the news at the moment that everyone's talking about. We've seen it uh, in the papers here in Australia. Everyone's talking about uh, your legal challenge with the Court of Arbitration for Sports. Do you want to tell us about that briefly? Yeah, you know, I've been in a battle. It started back in 2018 when I when I first broke my world record, and previously I broke Oscar's world record, and I went 44.42 seconds in the 400 meters. And literally after I ran that time, I, I got a letter from the IAAF, the Olympic Committee, uh, a part of a version of the Olympic Committee, that's the track and field side, notifying me, saying that yes, you ran a fast time. Yes, we put your times up. You're the you at the time I was I was ranked fifth in the world. Um, but we're, because you run on prosthetic legs, we're actually going to ban your times and ban you until we actually switch the burden of proof. So we put the burden of proof on you, the athlete. So since you run really fast on blades, you, the athlete, have to prove to us, the Federation, the Olympic Committee, why you run so fast on prosthetic legs. What are, what are the rules and, and, and what, what are the problems and, and the, you know, the, the kind of things that they set in place to, to, to stop this? It just that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, and I, it was very frustrating because when Pistorius actually ran in the Olympic Games, the burden of proof was actually on the Federation. So the Olympic Committee actually had to prove that Pistorius did not gain an unfair advantage. They could not prove that, which allowed him, so he won his appeal, which allowed him to run in the 2012, being the first double leg amputee ever to do it. Since they couldn't prove it and they didn't have enough information, they went back into the rule books and said, since we cannot prove this, we'll just switch it. And by switching the burden of proof, it will put the put so much burden on the athlete since they know they can't prove it, then that they'll never have a chance to compete in the Olympic Games. So what, why why don't they just do another study on on uh, African American men or people of uh, African descent? You know that that was the, that was the question that that I was asking, and and honestly, that was the 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 fair shake that I was looking for was like if you look at this and and this whole time this new max allowable standing height they call it mash that they gain the information from the paralympics and when the paralympics established this on double egg amputees you were seeing you know african americans and african amputees that that was dropping and losing almost four to five six inches i actually have a teammate regus woods that originally when he was wearing his prosthetic legs he was 5 11 
under this new max allowable standing height Paralympic rule. He's five foot four. So this whole time we knew it was off, but we didn't know why, right? We didn't know why until we got into the court case. And once we got into the court case and their defense against me was Blake's too tall, Blake's too tall. That's why he runs so fast. And my lawyers asked, well, why do you think Blake's too tall? Where are you getting your numbers from? Where are you getting your data? And they started asking these questions under oath. And they had to reveal. And then my lawyers went deeper and said, okay, if you think Blake should be five, eight and a half, who did you test in this population? Who, who, who did you test these numbers with and these calculations with? And by asking that, that's when they revealed that there was no Africans or African-Americans in this study. And also admitted that there could be a potentially or a possibility difference in body structures because of of that situation. So Would you say that this, this decision is overtly discriminating against black people of African descent? Yes, um, I, I think I would, it, whether it was deliberately or non-deliberately. Um, I think, at, at, and, and if, it, if it was an accident, if it, if, if it was by mistake, then why not recorrect it, like you said? Why not go back in and redo the study? Why not take the time? And, and at the end of the day, it, it offends me because one, I feel like the message is, well, you're, you're not important enough because you're disabled, right? To, to really look at this. So we're gonna switch burden of proof. So you have to prove to us because we don't wanna spend the time having to deal with somebody like you. So I go out and try and, and give all my time and energy and yeah. resources to prove to them why I didn't gain an unfair advantage. And once I do that, we get to the end of the road and they say, well, you're too tall. And the reason you're too tall because we didn't care enough to test more people that could potentially look like you or be built like you with Africans and Africans. We're just gonna take this one population, hmm. and this one study, or, you know, these two populations and compare you to that knowing that it, it could potentially so how, how do we do it then? I mean, how, how do we get them to do more research on African men who have clearly got you know, longer leg length to height ratios? I mean, I just, I, I want, I need, you know, people's opinion. I need the public opinion. You know, for me, you know, my dream is you know, not only to compete in the Paralympics, which I've, which I've done, but also to compete in the Olympic Games. You know, I think by being, being able to cross over and, and, and run at the highest level, regardless of my race or disability, is a true testament that anything that you go through in life, if you have dreams and goals that you can achieve them, regardless of the situation that you're in. Now, you're going to have blowback, and you're going to have rebuttal, but if you keep fighting through, you'll get to the end. And that, I feel like that my message could be reached out to the masses, to the, to the people all around the world, to that child that that's in China or in Africa or, or here in America or in Australia that's being discriminated against because of their disability, because of their race. And they're saying, well, look, Blake is doing it. So if Blake can overcome his adversity and his challenges, so can I. Like, that's what I'm fighting for. So if I'm, fi I, I'm fighting for myself, but I'm also fighting for a mission for other people. So I need people to, to stand up and, and, and to call out this injustice, to say this isn't right and this should be looked at. And we should reevaluate this. Blake, you are such a good speaker. You art articulate things so well and an incredible inspiration. I mean, not, not, just, not just for people who would, would be disabled, but people who have anything wrong in their life. They, they, they would see what you're going through and what you're doing. And it, it would just help anyone immensely with any sort of dramas they're dealing with. I'd, I'd love to know um, how they handle these disputes that they're, that they're, uh, they're having in the court. And, and if, if you think you'll actually win this appeal at the Court of Arbitration for Sports, when is that coming up? Man, we, we don't know. You know, we, 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 we fought our appeal and, and, and the Supreme Court hopefully get, will, will pick it up. And, and, and my lawyers are, are working daily. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm getting hit, hit with phone calls and emails daily to answer questions, to get the right proper information, to, to get me into the Olympic Games. Like, like, honestly, I'm in the best position when it comes to teams. When it comes to people, when it comes to coaches, when it comes to individuals like publicists and, and all kinds of people that's in my life that's just working to get me into the Olympic Games. Now, with that being said, I have the highest of the highest hope of running. Like I, every day that I wake up, I envision myself in that, in that Olympic final, right? I'm manifesting nothing but good energy and, and I'm speaking greatness into my life. Like, like I'm, I'm training, like I'm going to be in the Olympic final. Now, will it happen? I don't know. Right. I, it's, there's no guarantee. But that's what life is all about. It's, it's going for a dream. It's going for a goal to see the vision, not really knowing what's on the other side. But, but, but having that, that conviction of faith of it's going to happen. If I don't believe in it, if I'm not waking up and going to the track 
and training, like I'm going to be in the Olympics, then I'm wasting everybody's time. What you're what you're saying, it's it's just it's so powerful, man. And I get emotional just just hearing you you talk about it and and uh, you know these kind of disputes. I guess they're probably going to become more and more common because the uh, the technology is uh, is improving. I remember when I was the <laughs> Uh, the stadium announcer for the Paralympic Games at Sydney 2000. And uh, one one athlete I remember in particular from South Africa, his name was uh, Fanny Lombard. And uh, I kept calling him Fanny Lombard on the microphone and he came up and corrected me. But uh, he was such a legend. He was breaking every record in, in the shot put, in the, the sprint, in the... Uh, the javelin. He was just an, an incredible superstar and and a hero at home to to so many people. And uh, and and what they were talking about a lot back then was um, and they had a whole show about it at the Paralympic Games uh, was about the technology and how the the athletes' times and um, and distances are getting closer and closer to um, able bodied athletes. Time. Yeah. So so I've qualified for the Olympic time. I've hit the qualifying standard. Um, the past three years, um, and then also for, to put you in ex- example, that I ran last year at US uh, TF National Championships, at the, basically the, the national championships here in the states. Um, I was the only disabled athlete there. Um, I go there and I take fifth um, at nationals. I'm, I qualified for the for the world championship team, and that for in the times that I ran that weekend would have actually got me into any Olympic finals in the history of the Olympic Games. So I, I think that's a true testament that I want people to realize, like, I'm not here to be the sympathy story. I'm not here for the, the, the pat on the back. You know, even, even though I am disabled, I'm here to win. I'm here to yeah. compete. And, 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 and that's the tone and the message that I, I felt throughout the years was when I was average or when I was losing or when I would show up and, and be knocked out the second round or the first round, oh, everybody was so excited. They would clap for me they would pat me on the back and that was a great moment to to witness but the second i started beating people and the second i became a threat to to the other athletes and and to some feel like a threat to the sport you know we can't have a man with that was born without legs be the fastest man in the world that what would that look like to the sport right and i was i was hearing these things and i was feeling these things and you can imagine the things i was reading online and people calling me a cheater and you know, cyborg and, 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 uh, you know, all these crazy things that they feel like the reason why I'm running fast, but the reality of it is, is that it's my training. It's, it's my, it's my team. It's my mindset that I have on life that has allowed me to be in this position to run fast. Um, and, and, and I think that's why I want people to really understand is that it's, it, like I have an advantage. Yes, I do have an advantage, but it's not my legs. It was the fact that I was born without my legs and I had to battle back and fight my whole life to get to the position I am today. So when I step on the line and I'm, I'm racing the fastest runners in the world, and even though they might be physically faster than me or, or might have more limbs than me, my mental is way better than theirs. My, my mentality and my perception on life out trumps and people, them anytime. People act differently at the Olympics. You know, the whole world is watching and, you know, the, the electricity in the stadium and, and people perform better than their best. They break world records at the Olympics. So you, you don't know how good you're going to be until you're actually there at the start of the 100 meter sprint up against everyone else and standing for so much and so many people you know, that you'll be carrying on your shoulders right down there to the finish line. You know, even, even if you didn't win, it, 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 would just, it would be just such an incredible thing to watch. Tell us, tell us about your, your, um, the technology that you have there uh, the, in, in your legs and, and how you think the technology will get better. And, and do you think eventually maybe they'll have a different category because it'd be way faster than, than people with Yeah, legs. you know, the, what I'm running on is carbon fiber. Um, and, and it's the carbon fiber fit. And that's when I kind of thought the, the rebuttal um, and, and the, the, the debate was going to be was the unfair advantage comes in the legs. The unfair advantage comes in the carbon fiber spring. You get faster at the end. But the reality of it is when they really broke it down, they really can find some, very, something very specific to say this is the advantage. That, that, that you have, right? This is the advantage that you have over everybody else. They really just said, you're too tall. But the advancement of the prosthetic leg hasn't been too crazy, but the difference is the, 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 the ability to get a hold of them, right? So we're back in the, in the early 90s, in the, in, the, in, the, in the late 90s, in the late 80s, prosthetics was around, but people, they were so expensive. 
and and you couldn't you had to know somebody to know somebody insurance wouldn't buy them for you they just consider them a luxury and not a necessity so for me i went my whole life 18 years my first 18 years of my life i had nothing i didn't know nothing about the paralympics um my first 18 years i didn't even know nothing about running blades i just i would just get running legs that that my my parents insurance could afford or i would have to go to a, a shriners hospital here in america where they provide free free orthopedic care for pediatric orthopedic care so i you know technology was around but it wasn't getting to kids like me in east tennessee so it wasn't until i was yeah. adult but now that you have you know baby prosthetics you have blades for four-year-olds five-year-olds you know what i mean you have 11 year olds 10 year olds kids running in, in middle school and high school and they're, they're developing these muscles they're developing developing with the technology and learning how to become one with the technology to the point when they get my age it's going to feel natural to them so the fact that they're missing their legs won't be such a setback and to what people will see as an advantage here's a question for you do you think that you would be faster if you had legs or slower ah that's a tough question you know that's a, such a, a good question I, I i don't know you know and it's hard for me to answer that because i never had my legs i never had my legs to compare um i never had them to say you know this is what it what it would be like i could even tell you what it feels like to even wiggle your toes so so to say how fast i would be if i had my legs would would be tough but I, but i will say this and i and this is a question i have been asked and I've, I'm, a, I'm able to answer is do you ever wish you had your legs like do you ever wish you were never born like this do you ever wish you were just born normal and just had went through life and, and the answer to that is no I, I i i never wish i had my legs i'm actually thankful the fact that i was born missing my legs and had to endure and go through this yes i had tough times yes i had a hard life but now as an adult i can honestly say that i'm so thankful that i had to endure this because because it made me such a stronger person yeah and you are man you're an incredible human being um man it's it's such a, a great opportunity to talk to you and and i, I want to know more about about your story uh, but before i get to that um so where are we at with the court case and 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 when are they actually going to to have a decision for you or or when will the, the appeal happen is anyone going to tell you anytime soon no, I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, like everything's been set, been been sent in, but uh, it's a waiting game now um, for me, which is uh, unfortunate because you know my life is is in the limb right now. Like I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't know what's when it's going to be. I don't know when to get a phone call. Um, I don't know when when the next case is going to be. Hopefully, it gets picked up soon. Like I said, fingers crossed. But my mindset is just kind of focusing on what I can control, and, and what I can, can control is my attitude and my attitude towards life. You know, my attitude towards, you know, my family, my attitude towards my career, to my training. Um, there's, there's a lot of outside distractions going on, going around. And that's what I consider them as, as distractions. Um, to kind of what are you going to do if they what do you do if they don't let you compete? What if what if what if they just stick by the de decision and say, no, sorry, too tall. If you shorten your legs, you can compete. Will you shorten them or will you stick to your guns? Guns. Man, I, that's that is the, a conversation and a discussion. Um, that that I will have with my my team, um, with my full team, to say, look, this is how much time I put in. This is what we have. This is how short I have to be. This is my options of of competing where I can compete. At. Of course, the Paralympics. You know, I got my start in the Paralympics. Do I go back to the Paralympics? Do I stay in the courts and keep fighting? Um, there's so many um, unanswered questions that that have to be answered right now. If it, if it is a no, and uh, at the end of the day, I, I try not to think about it too much because it's just unfortunate to think that they would they would really want to deny me um for running the olympic games like i put my blood sweat and tears into this I've, I've dedicated my life to be one of the fastest men in the world and for them to chalk it up just to say because you're too tall on 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 calculations that don't even include my my race population it's just i don't think that's fair and and, I, and that's something that I, I i feel like i can fight for and i will fight for it i'm i'm gonna fight for you as well you know what we're gonna do if they say no what what we're gonna do? We're gonna get some sponsors, and we're gonna, we're gonna go to Tokyo, and we're gonna set up a track, and we're gonna fire the gun at exactly the same time that they do, and you're gonna run, and you're gonna beat them all, and we're gonna give you a medal, and we'll make sure it's an actual gold medal. Yes, and we get my own gold medal, and my own gold medal, and 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 that's the beautiful part. That's why I'm starting to realize, like when I got into this, it was it was to run in the Olympic Games, like it was the it was the do the beat Oscars world records. Like I had to do this. Like I had to walk in as an Olympian. But the main reason why I wanted to do all that was to inspire and to change lives and mindsets. 
to encourage other people that's fit, that's facing same similar situations that I am, and I can give them a little bit of hope and strength. So as long as I'm still accomplishing that, as long as I'm still doing that, whether that's in the Olympic Games or not, or in the Paralympic Games, or just walking down the street with a good attitude and a smile on my face yeah. and bumping into somebody else that's, that's facing a hard time that maybe, that maybe they're missing a leg or in a wheelchair or they know somebody and I can just speak life into them and say, I'm a, I'm a professional runner and this is what I've experienced and, and keep pushing and I'm still doing my mission. Blake Leeper, we are behind you. And if anyone else, else out there wants to get behind you, they should follow you on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you might be, and make, make a donation to your legal fight or whatever they can because uh, you deserve it, my friend. Hey, uh, we'll, we'll be watching that very, very closely. Let's, let's talk just uh, briefly about growing up and, uh, and who was the inspiration for you? Who helped you, you know, get, get to the point that you're at today where, where you just want to take on the world? Was it your parents? Yeah, I, 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 I believe I would give credit to my parents, uh, my family. You know, I, I really it starts with my parents because you can imagine having a disabled child, especially back in the day. Um, and like I said, late, late 80s, early 90s, having a disabled child, there wasn't too many options. Um, and, and of course, my, my diagnosis was I was never going to walk, never going to run, never going to jump. So as a kid, my parents really put the work in to say, Blake, you know, my, my dad was having conversations with me at like nine years old saying they're going to give you the, you know, pull me to the side, like, you know, they're going to give you the easy way out. When they do, you know what I mean? Don't take it. And I'm like, I'm mean, at nine years old. I'm like, dad, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> I want to go play Power Rangers right now, man. Like <laughs> get off my back. And, but lo and behold, like, you know, when he had those conversations with me, it'd be weeks later, I'd be at, at a basketball practice and we're doing, you know, runs. And at the end of the practice, the coach, you know, tells me, Blake, you don't have to do this last run. Feeling sorry for me because of my disability. And, and because that, and I remember those conversations that my father had with me saying, when you get, the e get, get offered the easy way out, you cannot and you should not never take it. You should always want to be the best in the world, regardless of, of your situation. And that's the mindset they st instilled in me at a very early Well, your dad's a dead set legend. Did you have trouble getting used to your new legs? And, and uh, what, what were the sports that you first had a crack at? I mean, honestly, it wasn't that bad for me because I, since I, you know, people always ask, like, how was it to lose your legs? And I'm like, I never had legs to lose. Like, this is, I, I, I learned how to walk on prosthetic legs. Um, so growing up as a kid, my, my biggest issue, of course, was, you know, I, 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 got, I would run around, like, say it was baseball or basketball, and I'll run around, run, run around the bases, and my leg falls off. <laughs> I, would, I would go down the basketball court, and, I, you know, I'll go for a layup, and boop, my, my, my right leg just goes flying into the, into the stands. And it, it happened so much that the refs and, the other team would even flinch towards the end of the season um, because they're like, oh, that's just Blake losing his leg. But you can imagine at the beginning of the year when a, when a leg goes flying, that's like a technical foul. That's like a, that's like a double foul. <laughs> you found the kid with no legs and his, and his legs come off. That's a, that's a flagrant. <laughs> well, if you're doing kung fu, it'd be an advantage. You can just flick your leg at someone and go, there you go, I win. I know. Just like boom, just hit it like a boomerang and just like hit somebody and come back to me. But it was like as I got older um the, the technology got a little bit better um and it, and it allowed me to like live a, a, a full life like I I, I I can remember times where I, I would, like a leg will fall off here and there and I, I might be a little bit slow here and there in certain things but when it comes to living a full life I, I felt like I, I lived a normal life growing up as a kid um and I and I, and I credit to that and I, and, I, and, I, and I tell other disabled kids you know because parents ask me all the time they say well should should I just sign them up for just only disabled events? Or, or is it okay for me to, to sign them up for, you know, events that has able-bodied athletes? And I, and I tell them, sign them up for everything. Do both. Do disabled events so they get to, to know how to compete other, against other people that's that equal to them. But also do able-bodied events so, so they know how close they are if they are behind, even with their disability. They say, yes, even with my disability, this is how far I am from the best athlete in the school. Or this is how far I am from, from the fastest athlete from school. Like that helps as well to go through that process to identify it. Hey, what was it like qualifying for your first ever Paralympics? I, I uh, heard a story uh, where you were telling your, your grandfather, I think it was, that you'd qualified and you wanted, wanted him to come along for the ride. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, it was, man, I'll never forget. I, I, got, I got the, I remember I made the team, it was in 2012, and I qualified for the, for the London Paralympic Games. And I remember they sent me my, like, my red uniform, and, that, and that's when it was real. And I got the, all the gear, and I went to my granddad, and I was like, I was like, granddad, like I made the, I made the Paralympic Games. Are you gonna come? And of course, he's like, 
he was my number one fan, right? And, and so I knew I had him. I was like, are you going to come watch me run? And he's like, what? He, he was offended the way I asked him. He was like, are you, are you kidding me? Are you serious? Of course I'm there. I'm, 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 I'm going to be in front row. But he didn't know exactly whether, you know, they was in London. So he's like, where are they yet? And I was like, I was like, they're in London. You know, Papa, I call him Papa, but grand, they're in London, granddad. He's like, he, he thought about it for a second. He said, okay, how, how far is that drive? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, and you have to understand, you know what I mean? My grand, the reason why he was asking that, because my granddad, he's, he's never, at 74 years old, at the, he was 74 at the time, he's never flown a day in his life. Um, growing up in, in East Tennessee and, and, he, and he poor construction, all of the jobs that he always had to do was he could drive them. And he, he hated flying. He never flew. So I was like, granddad, you know, I explained to him, like, look, you can't drive it. We got to fly across the pond. And, you know, you have to you hop on your first flight. And I, I can tell how nervous he was as he's thinking about flying for the first time in 74 years of his life. And he thought about it. He thought about it. But this is this is big. His his grandson, his, you know what I mean? His grandson's competing in the, on the world stage. So he thought about it. He said, do they serve alcohol on the plane? I was like, yes, they do, Granddad. So, so we got Granddad <laughs> drunk <laughs> and took him to London. And he had um, the time of his life just experiencing, you know, he went to the Big, he went to Big Ben and, and, and he wrote the I and all this amazing, you know, the, he wrote the tube. And, and, and I never forget, it was after I, um, I won my first medal. It was a silver medal. Uh, or it was a bronze medal at 200 meters. And after I won, I, I had to dive across the line. And, and I got my medal and I ran up to the, in the stadium, in the London Olympic Stadium to meet my family to celebrate. And when I got there, I see my mom, I see my dad, and my, my grandmother was there and I had a couple aunts and uncles and we were celebrating, but I couldn't find granddad, right? But I couldn't find my granddad who flew all this way, you know what I mean? To watch his grandson compete for the first time, his first flight. But then I take a beat and I look over in the corner and there's granddad, granddad crying like a two-year-old, like a, just like a little baby, just tears, just like, running down his eyes and it but it wasn't tears of of, of, of sadness it was tears of joy because when i won the medal it was leaper my last name on this on the stadium and the, you have to stand that was his last name too as well and all that just you can imagine being a grandfather and having a grandchild being born without legs and all the worry and 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 just i, I could tell he loved me when i couldn't love myself i could tell he prayed for me when i could even figure things out as a child and, and him seeing me in that moment was just a sigh of relief of saying that my grandson that was born without legs is going to be okay, right? And, and, and that moment really changed my life and, and put it really put it in perspective for me that there's a lot of people out here fighting for me. So, so at, at bare minimum, the least I can do is, 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 is keep pushing forward. So, you know, earlier we, when we was talking about like, where do you find the motivation and, and the inspiration to keep pushing forward. I take moments like those that, that's happened in my life that's been really, really important to me. And, and I apply that daily. So when I'm facing hard times or when I get a no from the Olympic committee, you know what I mean? They say, you're, you're too tall, give up. Um, I can't, I can't give up because I think about moments like those and my granddad um, and, and, and he fought for me. So I'm a fight. I'm gonna keep fighting. That is such a beautiful story. I love that, and uh, I've, I think I've seen that on uh, on one or two of your TED talks and uh, in inspirational, motivational uh, talks that you do, and and they've had millions of views online. If if anyone would like to go and check them out, uh, you are obviously an inspiration to so many people. Is is there any other um, Paralympians or any other athletes and Paralympians that that you mentor or you work with or you train? Yeah, so you know, I, I train actually a young kid right now. His name is, is Ruben. Um, he actually just lost his legs a couple years ago. He's out of Long Beach. Um, and, and he lost his leg in a drive-by shooting uh, on the way home from a baseball game his junior year in, in high school. Um, and he was one of the star pitchers for his high school team. And coming home with the, with the fellas, celebrating the game, um, just in a, in a, in a, in a gang-infested neighborhood, unfortunately. And it came by, and he was, he was hit by one of the bullets and lost his leg above the knee. And you can imagine being in high school, everything going good. He was he was getting recruited by by colleges for baseball. Then boom, overnight his life changed for forever. Um, that was almost four or five years ago, and I remember visiting visiting him when he just lost his leg. He wasn't even a prosthetic leg. Just spending time with him, not really, you know what I mean? Not really forcing Paralympics. And that's the thing. People think like just because I'm a Paralympic, I just like show up like you gotta run Paralympics. Like that's <laughs> you have to do it. Like it's not for everybody. And I just really wanted to encourage him to say, look, there's a life 
after losing your leg. Like there's uh, so many, I showed him my blades, showed him my medals. Then fast forward two or three years later, actually this past couple of years, he reached back out to me and said, you know, I've, I've grown up a little bit. I've got through co- high school. I'm, I'm going into college and I really want to make a run for the Paralympic Games. Um, and so I've been training him. It's been tough during COVID because all the tracks have been closed down. So we've been doing like a lot of virtual stuff and just checking in with them and parking lot runs and, and beach runs and grass runs. But working with him and, and, and just seeing his progression, because, you know, he started from, you know, three years ago, four years ago, he had both his legs. And now he's trying to make a run for the Paralympic Games. Like, you know, people think, say, oh, Blake, you're such a motivation and inspiration. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's easy. I was born like this. I didn't have a choice. But for somebody like him who, who, who had his leg and to go through a tragic situation like that and to lose it and still have the determination, motivation to keep fighting back, to say this ain't it, like, wow, that, that, that kid is tough to where it would be, be easily to, to give up, to say, I don't want to do this. And, and rightfully so, life and, and his friends and family probably be like, you know what, man, you're right. Like, this sucks. Like, it sucks that you had to go through this. Like, go sit, go sit down. You don't have to do this. Like, you, you've been through enough. But he chooses the latter and say, I want to make better out of my life. And I want to put, you know what I mean? I want to, I want to be an example for the rest of the world. Saying, even though you get blindsided, like his, his situation, he was blindsided. To get blindsided, but you still got to have the motivation and determination to keep pushing forward. And as long as he keeps doing that, I'm going to pour as much as I can pour into him. What do, you, what do you say to someone out there that might be watching this now? Uh, it, could, it could be uh, someone with a disability thinking about competing in the Paralympic Games or, or someone that's, that's only recently just got a, a disability. What would you say to them to, to help lift them, like you, you've said to so many people in, in the past and helped? What, 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 is, what is the, uh, the go-to story that really gets them going and, and helps them to take things to the next level? Yeah, yeah. For, for, for me, you know what I mean? I, I started out with, I, I say the only true disability in life is a bad attitude. Um, and, and I'm a true believer of that. And I, and I, and I, I want people that's going through tough times, especially people that, that, that feel, like, feel like they're disabled, right? They feel like they're disabled, right? But the only thing they is, they're just differently abled. You know what I mean? People are born, you know what I mean? People are born short, people are born tall. People are born with good vision, bad vision. People are born with legs, people are born without legs. It's just, it's just choose, choose your heart. Right. You have to choose your heart and have to learn how to deal with it. Sometimes your heart might be harder than others. But if you embrace it and accept it and say your adversity is your advantage, then whatever tough times that you're facing is going to build you. So you should embrace and embrace and get excited about it. Right. I'm, ex- I'm excited for the opportunity and the challenges that I'm going to face tomorrow because it's going to make me a stronger person. Right. So whatever, like if you look at it like and I tell people, if you line me up a man with out legs, but I have a good attitude on life. And you get an able-bodied guy born with completely normal and healthy, but just looks at life just terribly. Like he, like, just like, I hate my life. I hate this. Has a bad attitude towards everything. Then I would take my situation hands down anytime. Give me, give me the, give me life without legs and a good attitude. Because with, with a good attitude, you can conquer a lot more things. It's a mental game. How do you, how do you keep so positive yourself? How do you, how do you keep your head sane and straight and, and, you know, focusing on all the positive things in life? Life. Man, I do the work. I you have to do the work, and and I, and I'm a true believer of that. Whether it's, it's talking to a, you know a psychologist, a therapist, you know I, I see a sports psychologist myself. Um, I, I do a lot of just reading and writing and meditation, and I, you know I listen to to inspirational talks. All my YouTube is filled with inspirational talks. I, I just from TD Jakes to Tony Robinson to to you know I mean Les Brown. Like I, I listen to them, listen to them all. Just, just feeding my, my soul and my body with just pure happiness. Because this is what I realized. Because I was born without legs, I realized at an early age, if I don't do the work, if I don't wake up in the morning and, and, and fight for my happiness, if I just let life come to me and say, oh, it is what it is, then life is going to beat me up. Because being born without legs is tough. I get bruises. I get swollen. I trip. I fall, I'm clumsy, like all these things just compile on my, and this is just getting to the bathroom in the morning. <laughs> this is just waking up in the morning. All these things happen, <laughs> right? And, and if I don't do the work, then, I, then I'm just in a bad place. What do you use to psych yourself up every day? You wake up in the morning and you meditate and have breakfast and, you know, you call your best friend. It, it's, um, it, the mental health thing is, is uh, so prevalent in society today. We're all talking about it because of what, what we're going through 
uh, worldwide with, with COVID and, and all sorts of, you know, crazy political problems happening all over the planet. Uh, you know, everyone needs to, to focus on their mental health and, and, and doing those kind of things. It, it, it really does help, doesn't it? It does. And here's the thing. Because of my physical disability, it was a lot easier for me to identify that I had to do the work, right? Because I was born without legs, it was easier to relate to say there could be a, a correlation to my attitude because of my physical disability. So I really need, need to do the work to make sure I'm in a good mental space to be able to handle the adversities that I'm facing. Now, if you don't have the, the, the natural physical disabilities that we can identify, then you wouldn't feel tugged on your heart to really have to do the work, right? Like everything is fine. Like I'm, 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 I'm average. I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm not doing great, but I'm not doing bad. So why, why would I need to do the work until something like we're facing today, like COVID, you know, lost jobs, lost lives, like all these things are happening, but we don't have the tools to be able to do the work. So it's, it's, it's very imperative that I tell people that, you know what I mean, work on yourself. Take that 15 minutes, that 10 minutes in the morning instead of picking up your phone and, and looking at Instagram or looking at your emails. Like spend that time and invest it back into yourself. Listen to a, a powerful speech or an inspirational podcast or a sermon or something that's going to uplift your spirits and see how much that, that changes your day and your outlook moving forward. Just taking, just taking a beat. And identify and saying, yo, if I don't do this work, then I'm not going to be in the place that I'm going to be. And that's really humbling yourself and putting yourself in a vulnerable situation and saying, I need help. I think you need to bookend your day with positive things, whether it's, you know, waking up first thing in the morning, meditating, you know, listening to a positive speech or talking to a, a good friend who's always positive, And then at the end of the day, doing the same thing, because... Uh, otherwise, that sort of echoes in your sleep and you don't sleep well uh, and, and people get addicted to these echo chambers on Facebook. Where they're saying, you know, so many negative things, whether it's about politically the left or the right or you get stuck in a, in a, in a COVID rabbit hole where you, you're reading all these COVID stories and it stresses you out and, you, and, and it can really you know, suck you into this vortex that stresses you out for the whole day and makes you an unhappy person. So don't do that to yourself, people out there. Listen to Blake and, and, and follow what he's saying. Hey, how is it going over there because of COVID? Are you, uh, you in lockdown at the moment? Where are you? Lockdown. We, we just went back on lockdown in Los Angeles. It's, it's, it's been ridiculous. I mean, it's been crazy. Like we've been had the, especially as an Olympian, you know what I mean? Trying to train for the Olympics. We've had park shut down. We've had track shut down. We've had, you know, gyms are shut down. Like we just had, I mean, I've been literally been running in parking lots and, and, and just random, just parking structures. I had to go to a parking structure um, and down, down in the basement and go to the bottom floor <laughs> and literally where nobody would see us and nobody would bother us. And we might, you know, get hit by a car too that's down there, but nobody really come down there and just run, you know, on the concrete for, for miles and miles and miles. We have to get creative. It, it's, it's it's tough. It's it's very very tough trying to navigate this and 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 figure it out. But like you said, if if you let it consume you, it can get worse. And and so I'm just trying to like keep stay as positive as possible. Like I you know I I find myself you know waking up daily or you know every other day they write my gratitude list. Like you know I, 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 my track gets shut down, my gym gets shut down. You know I had a had a track meet that was canceled, the Olympics were canceled now, and all the everything that I had lined up, you know what I mean, that was gonna be big in my life. I get the I get the note from I get the note from the Olympic committee. Like I'm just like you know, I had these moments myself, like what what's going on? Like I'm hearing a lot of no's and, and a lot of things are getting shut down and canceled and you know a lot of family members getting sick and not you know what I mean not make all these things are happening. So I had to take a step back and work on my gratitude list. I had to write my gratitude list out. And, 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 and start out and write all the things that even though things are upside down right now, and even though things are crazy right now, what, what, what am I thankful for today? Like just for the moment, in the moment, you know what? I'm thankful to be alive today. You know what? I'm, I'm, for me personally, I'm thankful that I can walk today. You know, even though I was born without legs, I can still put my prosthetic legs on to go out there and, and walk. You know, I'm, I'm thankful I can run. You know, I still have a career. I still have an opportunity. You know, even though the Olympics got canceled, it, it, it got pushed back. It didn't get canceled. So then it starts putting it in perspective for me. So I'm like, you know what? I, I, I still got something to fight for. How, how is everyone going now in California? Are they, uh, are they t all taking it seriously? Are they practicing the social distancing? Uh, are people wearing masks out there on the street? Are they, are they wary of this virus? Because I know there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there that think it's not really happening. 
Uh, I mean, here in Australia, we've been through lockdown at the start of the year. Uh, Queensland, where I am, we, uh, we, were, we were quite lucky and, uh, and we, we haven't had um, any cases for quite some time. But Australia's just come out of lockdown. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, Blake Leeper. Man, it's, it's tough, you know, you know, especially here. I, I can remember, was it back in March where we went on the first lockdown and it was, it was scary. I, I never, you know, me personally, me and my, my fiance, we was, we was pregnant at the time. So we, we actually had a, a baby <laughs> during lockdown, a baby during quarantine. We had a quarantine baby. Oh, um, congratulations. Yeah, a she was, she was He's a daddy. July 27th, 20, um, 2020. Yeah, yeah. Wait, we had it. So <laughs> we're going to tell her Chris going to be a crazy story. The boy or a girl? It's a girl. It's a girl. I'm a girl dad. Thea Blake Leeper. Oh, beautiful. Congratulations. That's, that's such a, a nice story. Yeah, thank you. But, you know, going through that as parents and, you know, new new parents and seeing the hospitals get crazy and, and I couldn't even go to, I would say, half of the, of, the, of the doctor's appointments because it was only the mother and the baby, you know what I mean? The mother and the baby was in her womb. So I, I just had literally had to sit in the, sit in the wait, like in a hallway. I couldn't even go into the waiting room. Like just going through that process was, it was getting scary. It was, you know what I mean? And, and it still is, but you know, now we're in a position where, you know, some people are getting fed up, you know what I mean? Some people are getting frustrated, you know, here for us in California, they open this back up and they're locking this back down. Um, and, and, and it's tough for people. People are losing jobs. You know what I mean? People are losing lives. Like it's just so much that's just going on. What about all the homeless people on the streets of LA as well? I mean, homelessness has always been a problem there. I mean, how are those people handling it? It's, it's getting worse. You know, I was I was actually down down by the beach the other day. And, you know, Venice Beach sometimes have their issues. You know, a little bit of homeless is hard. You know what I mean? Like they're trying to monetize it as best as possible. But with COVID and, and you know, the, the, the housing so expensive here in, in the city that it just took a toll on the homeless. And it's just just so sad to see. It just breaks my heart. You know what I mean? When I'm driving through the city and I'm and seeing people on the side of the road that's just just completely struggling on their last end and with, with nowhere to go, with, with, with no resources whatsoever. And, 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 and when I, with the feeling that I'm feeling, and I, I don't know how everybody else is, but what, what's next? Like, 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 what do we go from here? Um, you know, I mean, what, what, what should we do? You know, the, I know the vaccine is coming out and, the, you know, we're getting prepared to administrate that and what levels, but like, how do we move from here? You know, like, how do we rebuild from this point? You gonna take the vaccine, do you think? I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. Are you? I don't know. That's a good question. I got to say, I got to talk to my doctor about it. I'm not that. taking it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait until probably about a year or two, just so it's been tested on a few people. And if no one's had any weird growths happen or heart attacks or anything like that, then I'm, and I think I might take it. What, what the problem is going to be is, is if they start bringing in into your passport and you can't travel overseas unless you've had the vaccine, which is, is, is going to be a worry. And I- and I go in and be like, I lost my legs. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> do you do that a lot? Do you play jokes on people? Do you kick off your leg just for a laugh? Yeah. I can imagine like, you would. Yeah, I have to. I mean, honestly, and, that, and that's what I tell people. Like, the one easy way to, the like, one good way I, I was able to, to get through my challenges and my disability was to have a, a, like, a good attitude towards it and always laugh at the situation. So any chance I got, I, I had to play jokes and pranks, so, like, we would go knock on neighbors' doors. And I would turn my leg backwards, like just lay in the yard, my leg by my head. And my leg would be like <laughs> up here. You know what I mean? And I just, <laughs> Look how good at yoga you are. <laughs> freak people out all the time. But if you, if you can't laugh at yourself, you can't have, if you're taking yourself too serious, then, then life is no fun whatsoever. So you got to be able to, to roll with the punches, have fun, and just keep pushing through. And especially when things are so serious, I mean, COVID and you had the, the Biden Trump election and all of the Black Lives Matter that's a, uh, protests that are going on in America and California was a, a big part of that. I, um, I've got a friend who's an NBA skills coach, uh, Irv Rowland. I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, he was out there protesting every day with, with the movement. Was that something that, that uh, came into your life in any way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. You know, I mean, especially growing up, you know, I grew up in East Tennessee. You know what I mean? And seeing all the things that was happening in America, especially with the black lives, was just, it was breaking my heart, man. Me, me and my fiance, we sat down and we watched the Breonna Taylor story the, again the other day. Um, it was broken down. I think it was on Dayline. And midway, I was just, I, I personally was in tears. Like, like, like when they broke down that case and what really went down in, in, in Kentucky, 
like and and the negligence and all the terrible things that went on in that case it brought me to tears you know what i mean and i'm not that emotional but it just broke my heart so much it's just a shame that that all these terrible things are happening here in america but you flip it and reverse it and you see the George Floyds and you see the Breonna Taylors and you see how they're changing lives and mindsets and, and that they put people in a position where it can be called out. Like that's, that's, that's the beautiful part. We hate that their lives had to be sacrificed for something like this, but at least change is happening. Will Smith said in an interview the other day, um, racism's not getting worse. It's just being televised. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Cause people, you know what I mean? You know, we talk about the issues with the police, especially being black. I can remember when I was like 15, 16 years old. I'll never forget this. It was my first time I had my license. It was me and two of my best friends. And I was staying at my grandparents' house. And the reason, and the reason why we stayed at my grandparents is they, that we knew we could stay out later with my grandparents. <laughs> you get away anything with your, with your grandparents. So we was getting ready and we was, we was getting dressed. I just got my license and we're on my way out. Right? My grandmother calls us down. And she sits all three of us down on on the on the on the couch, and she's about to give us this bit. We can, we know we're about to give this. She's about to give us a long speech. And in my head, I think it's going to be about don't drink and drive, don't drink. You know, the grandmother talk. Don't you know? Don't have sex. Be responsible. You know, we're high schoolers. So, and and the only thing that she said, she was like, "Look, boys, if you guys get pulled over by the police, if you get pulled over by the cops, call us. Call either me." Your parents call one of us so we can be on the phone with you and hear the conversation and call somebody else if something bad happens. This was almost 16, 17 years ago. And she was having this conversation with me. So now you fast forward, uh, you know, almost 20 years later and we're still seeing the same issues and the same worry and the same burden as a, as a, a, as a black human being stepping out of the house and the issues they have with the police it's just, it's not new to us. It's not new. It's just now being talked about. It's now being talked about and and, and hopefully that's a, a step in the right direction for change. And, you know, America uh, is is leading the way in, in, in that aspect, uh, looking for change. I mean, in Australia, we still have the problem happening here. I mean, I've got a friend, his name's Jesse Williams. He played for the Seattle Seahawks. He's uh, an Indigenous kid from Australia, from uh, Thursday Island. And he uh, he still gets pulled over every day, every day because he drives a nice car. And they're like, "Hang on a minute, he's got got a few face tattoos, but that's no no reason just to to pull him over all, all the time." But do you feel like that now there's a, a light being shone on this this kind of uh, police brutality and and racism that uh, that that actual change is happening? Yeah, I mean, I I think I think it is. You know, I think the light is 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 being shined on so where the actual change can happen to where you have these incidents like like George, where, you know, it's just so egregious. But I, I think that the important part, and if you really look at it, is, 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 the, is the system and how it's set up for, for you know, I mean, what, what is really being taught um, to, to certain police officers and, and what is the, the mentality that they're learning through, through that's being passed down through years and years of what we call training in which we need the protection. But if, but if, if we as, as the black community are, are not feeling protected, you know what I mean, by, by the police, then, then what position are we, are we left in? Who do we go to? Who do we call on? Um, and I think that's the issue that we've been kind of voicing our, our voice and opinion to this situation. And hopefully change will happen, but it's going to take years. And it's not going to just stop with, with one conversation. It's going to take multiple, multiple conversations and really hit a nail on the head and say, we need to get this fixed. Blake Leeper, that is a whole other podcast. I'm sure that we could talk about it for hours. But, uh, you know, fingers crossed things will uh, will change for the better in America in that aspect. And for you, my friend, good luck with the uh, the court case coming up. I, I would just love nothing more than to see you competing at the Olympics. I'm sure you'd smash it and come home with that gold medal for your family, for America, for you and so many people out there who look up to you. Blake Leaper, you deserve yes. it. And if people want to follow you and hear about more of what you're doing in your life, your inspirational stories, follow the court case. Where can they find you Blake. Blake. Yes, you can find me on Instagram, of course. I'm trying to get my followers up on Leapster. It's L-E-E-P-S-T-E-R. And Twitter, Blake underscore Leaper. Um, and my website, of course, Leaper.run. Um, but if, if, if anything, the, the, the biggest takeaway for me is if, if, if you t- eat, get gained anything from my message, if you took away anything from my message, then I hope you can just spread this positivity and this information out to the world and say, you know what, I was thinking one way and listen to Blake 
I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good about myself. So I want to, I want to tell you about it. And so you can feel good about yourself. And it just, hopefully it's just a chain reaction of just positivity, just going through the world from here to Australia. Good on you, mate. Hope you get out of lockdown soon. Thanks so much for the chat. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, mate. What an absolute legend. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to uh, catch up on all the episodes on themike.com, and we're now in partnership with australianonlinenews.com.au. Get all the news all the time, daily news updates with Christy Johns, and a publication of Australia's best news. There's this great new thing on australianonlinenews.com.au where you can click local, and there's literally hundreds of local websites, whether it's Byron, Ballina, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, Hey, that's pretty much only up here in Queensland, but that's where I spend most of the time. But uh, so many other places in every state and territory in Australia. So check it out in the local section of australianonlinenews.com.au. My name is Mike Goldman. Thanks for watching on the mic. Every minute of every day, news is breaking. And in a changing world, what you need to know is changing too. Introducing Australian Online News, your new home of the most trusted sources from across the globe. No clickbait, no waiting, just all the news, all the time.